Good evening. Well, praise the Lord, we're here. Wow, there's an echo in here. Um, well, we're going to see if we can get through tonight without um, coughing. I've got my pump right here, my albuterol to help open up those airwaves. And hopefully I'm not going to be overtaken by these sinuses. Much better, but still got a long way to go. Okay, here we go. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your loving kindnesses and the great multitude of your tender mercies. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to come together again to study your word. I ask now in the name of Jesus that you would hear us as we petition you tonight on the behalf of those who are less fortunate than us, those who are in the midst now of a storm, of a trial, of a test. Father, we're asking now for the mercy that you've granted to us, that which you have promised us in Jesus' name. Father, because we love you, because we are your children, you promised to deliver us and show us long life and satisfy us with long life and show us your salvation. We thank you for your healing hand now. We thank you for your merciful hand. Father, we pray for those that were in the tragedy today in Texas. Our hearts go out to them and we thank you now for the comfort that only you can give to them. I pray that you would be a light in that community. They will let you shine in that community so they can see your love even through this. Father, now we ask for wisdom and direction as we study your word. Keep us from the spirit of error in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Somebody said to me, I didn't look well the last Bible study, and perhaps I really wasn't, um, but I thank God that I'm feeling 99 and a half uh, now. And I know 99 and a half won't do, but that's the way I feel. I thank God for it tonight. I want to go to Galatians chapter six, but I got to go back and snatch the last part of chapter five. <laughs> And thank you for the suggestions last week for um, remedies to my runny nose and my sinuses draining and, and those things. They do help me for a little while, but I just got to go through this. I don't know why. And um, each year seems to get worse for only a short period of time. It will pass. All right. We stopped last week in chapter five. And I snuck out on verse 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. <coughs> verse 24 says, they that have crucified, or they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Now, one thing I did not say last week, Paul says this in, in Romans. He says, I know that in, in my flesh, this right here, can you see it? This right here dwelleth no good thing. So then that which I allow not, that's what I do. That which I do not allow that. I mean, that which I allow, I do not. And that which I do not allow that I do. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So we find then a law that is present that whenever I try to do good, evil is always present. And the enemy is going to always try to keep us. <coughs> Excuse me. He's going to always try to keep us from doing what is right. There's always going to be a struggle with the flesh. There's always going to be a pull, a tussle. And um, again, it's not always the big three. Sometimes it's God saying to you, let that person know that you love them or that you forgive them. <laughs> Excuse me. Boy, that devil, I declare I'm fine. <sighs> I'm fine until Bible study. Wow. Come on, devil. Leave me alone. Um, subtle things, such as praying for your enemy. I remember one time the Lord told me to pray for one of my enemies, and that was a struggle. And I hemmed and hawed about and had prayed and did something until I earnestly prayed for her. And um, so the flesh is always pulling against whatever the Lord has for us to do. And what he has called us to do. Golly. All right. So um, because of this, he says that when we are Christ, we crucify the flesh with those, those affections and lust. 
the things that make the flesh jump, the things that make the flesh spring into action. He says, we have crucified those things. And then the lust are the things that draw the flesh out, draws them or draws the flesh to be pleasured. So if it's um, oftentimes, it's just a matter of, of having an argument. I want to argue. You know, I want to be right. I want everybody to see my point of view. <laughs> All right. Or I want the biggest cookie. I want the biggest drumstick. That reminds me. Mm. Um, and so we're always being pulled to some pleasure of the flesh. And that's not always sin, but it may not be convenient. God wants to crucify. I told God, you have 100% of me. And that means that I can't sneak back to, you know, my old habits of eating chocolate when I know I shouldn't have it. Or for me, it was comic books. The Lord said, get rid of your comic books. So I had to get rid of those things because they were taking space that he wanted, not necessarily sin, just what he wants. All right, so verse 25 says, if we live in the spirit, then let us walk all, or let's also walk in the spirit. So again, I don't know if I, if it was Sunday, I said, I was talking about, there's two of us. The me you can see and the me you cannot see. And the me that you cannot see is the life that I want to live. I want to live in the spirit. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to enjoy the presence of God as much as possible. I told someone this week, we're um, so busy stressing over the present danger that we cannot uh, glorify God for what he's already done. Psalms 100 says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for it is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. What it's saying to us is that when we come before God, come rejoicing. No matter what our problems are, our situations are, our struggles are, come rejoicing. Because whatever we're going through, there is a reason to praise him. There is a reason to glorify him. And so we got to keep the praise going and God will deal with our trouble. Look at Sunday's message. Don't let trouble trouble you. Don't get distracted by one flat tire when you got three good tires. You say, yeah, but I can't move with one flat tire. No, you can't. But you can rejoice in the fact that I only got to replace one. And if we have an attitude of praise, gratitude, it will help us. I'm not saying it's a magic wand, but it conditions us. We're troubled where? Every side, but not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair. So we're going to have the trouble. All right. So now verse 26 says, let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Now, and I wanted to throw this in. First thing. When Paul wrote this, there were no chapters and verses. You know that, right? So this flows right into the next chapter. So the last verse is saying, let's not be selfish and live a life that everything must go our way and be pleasing to us. It, it blows my mind how people just do not understand how selfish they can be. Someone said to me that they uh, had an altercation with a family member and I was shocked and appalled. I was angry. And um, I said to them, you know, I sent them some scriptures. And I said, you know, this is what God requires of us. And, and the person was like, well, I always do. You just told me that you got out of line with your family, that you, that you, you know, that there was no display of love and respect to that person. And now you turn around and say, oh, I always respect them. And I just, I literally threw my hands up and said, I, I will not engage in that conversation. I will not engage with that person as it relates to um, this issue. I'm not gonna do it because they're so oblivious of their actions that all they see is I'm right and everybody else is wrong. So Paul says, don't live that way. You got to be always applauded and put on the pedestal. He says, no, don't live that way. That you're envying each other. You're provoking one another, not to good things, but to selfish things. And, and um, you know, we could use the scenario um, 
you know, I was growing up in church and we used to have a lot of different programs and one was pastor's appreciation. And I remember this one church, they, um, they, they fellowshiped, uh, these churches fellowship annually. So whatever one church did last year, the other one's going to do that plus. So they, um, they were up to like $10,000 because I guess the last, the last time the offering was, uh, you know, six, seven, eight thousand dollars, maybe even five thousand. So they did ten thousand this time. And it's a display of love, yes, but what it turned into was a burden because now we've got to outdo somebody else. And and, and the people are like, we're tired of this because we can't even do anything else. We got to raise money for this all year long. All right. So we got to be careful that our actions are actions of love and not selfish actions. So turn the spotlight on us to see what our motives really are. Okay, let's move on into chapter six. I'm excited tonight because I'm going to get through this in one take. All right, brethren, oh, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. Well, I guess I have to take that back now because this is like three weeks worth of stuff. Now, if a brethren is overtaken in fault, if a man is taken in any wrongdoing, overtaken in some deviation, be overtaken in any trespass, and these are different translations, listen, remember the two people, the outside you and the inside you. And it's so important because God says, I look on the heart. I don't look on the outside because I already know the outside is no good does not mean never means that we live any kind of way we do anything that we want to do because we want to walk in the spirit we want the spirit man to have control of the earthly man or the flesh man or the carnal man but there are going to be times that we will be overtaken in a fall we're going to stumble we're going to fall we might do it intentionally because in the flesh there's no good thing you cannot ever let me tell you something you can never trust your flesh you can never trust it. So if it's if in the case of righteousness, you cannot trust your flesh. You can't trust your flesh to make the right judgment, the right call, to treat people the right way. You cannot trust your flesh because flesh is always self-serving. So now what do we do when our pastors, our teachers, our evangelists, deacons, fathers, brothers, cousins, uncles are overtaken in a fall? And again, it runs the gamut. The, the um, sexual promiscuousness, I just want to say that big word, you know, cheating on the wife or husband, you know, whatever, stealing money from the church, um, running off and leaving your kids, you name it. Whatever you want to, whatever label you want to use, whatever actions you want to call out, the scripture here says overtaken, meaning that that was drawn to the flesh because every man is enticed when he's drawn away of his own lust. So I'm never going to be tempted to drink a bottle of help me now crown royal. Royal crown. I'm never going to be tempted. that. So you can fill the house up with crown royal. Um, and I've seen it in peach and I love peach. Anything peach just about I'll eat it. I love it. Um, I've seen peach schnapps. My granddaddy drank that peach schnapps, um, peach crown royal, and I don't know, raspberry, I don't know, whatever flavors. You can fill the house with it, and I will step over the bottles, knock them over, run through them. I have no interest in them whatsoever. So guess what? I will never be tempted by that. But there is something that will wake up my flesh. And I and sometimes I win the battle and sometimes I don't. We all. So what do we do? Are we supposed to walk away from our brothers if they have extramarital affairs or our sisters? Because that happens too. Are we supposed to just walk away? And it's a very difficult thing because in a marriage, when a husband or a wife is, has been less than faithful, the other person is devastating. They fall apart and that world is like, I just can't go on. I just can't trust them. I can't trust her. And I said to someone the other day, I said, I don't mean to sound uh, 
uncaring or callous, but that whole, I can't trust him, that's a lie. That is a lie that's been fed to us by the enemy that tells us that we cannot trust a person because of something they did. If God is not surprised, why are you? And why am I saying this? Because uh, not to diminish anything that they've done, but trust, if trust is based on what you do, that's back to the law again. It's back to the law. It's the condition of your heart. It's the condition of your heart. If your heart is not right, you're not going to trust them. But you don't know what they did to me. I don't have to know what they did to you. I know that you serve a savior who looked beyond all of your fault, so all your need, loved you. But I'm not Jesus. True, you're not. So, I mean, you have to live in that. But trust me when I say, and we can talk about it later, that whole I don't trust him, I don't trust her. Mm, no, that, that's that's a little bit more of a lie than it is truth. Okay. If I leave a quarter on the table and you walk by and take it the first time, and I leave a quarter the second time, and you walk by and you take it, I can trust you to take my money. That's your temptation. That's your lust. You're drawn to that. What I would do is not put it so that you can be tempted by it. I'm not bothered by the fact that you steal. So I'll make sure I put my stuff away so that you can't get it because it's a, it's your fault. That's overtaking you. Now I'll get you some help or whatever, hit you in the head, something. But it's the fault that's overtaking you. So now what happens is my job is as a spiritual, you who are not walking in the flesh, but in the spirit, restore. That's my job. Repair them. That's my job. All right. Mend them. Prepare, restore. Now, I know this is like shade tree psychology and it's like ABC, one, two, three, and it's done. No, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. But when we see our brothers and our sisters who have called the name of Jesus to become Christians, our job is to learn to pray for them so that they don't live in the flesh, but they live in the spirit. And so the question is, how many of us have done that at any time? When you're dealing with the flesh, I, I trust the flesh to do what it do. So if I was married and my wife was having extramarital affairs, I could trust that she's going to do that. So I'm not going to get all, this is me now. So I'm crazy. I'm not going to be out of shape over that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to seek to restore or repair that relationship. And I hope that makes sense to you. And I know that Relationships are difficult, period. To the people that you love deeply, relationships are difficult. But um, this is just food for thought now, okay? It's food for thought. Now he says, do it in the spirit of meekness. Don't do it as an authoritarian. I'm better than you, and so you better listen to me. No, not that way. But say, hey, I'm here for you. I understand. This is an issue. I understand. This is a problem. I understand. Let's go get some counseling. Let's talk to somebody about it. Let's 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 use every resource we can, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. This is my honest opinion. I feel like you're doing this or I see this and see that. Let me help you. Now, if that person refuses it, then what can you do? What can you do? But when people want to be restored, it is our job to do it. Not sit them on the bench six months, not turn them out of the church because they got pregnant or they got somebody pregnant. That is not our job. We are not the judge and jury. Our job is to restore them, to pray for them, to love them, to restore them. OK, but then he says, now make a note. Because you don't want to get tempted also. Mm. Will you be tempted to do the same thing? Perhaps, perhaps not. But you can be tempted to follow the lust of your own flesh. So you got to be careful when you are restoring other people. And it don't take a lot of this. It takes a lot of this. Okay. Verse two, bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. It is our job to lift the heavy weights off people. Okay. All right. So their mortgage is due and they don't want to work. That's not a burden I'm supposed to lift. That's not what I'm talking about. 
I'm not talking about giving your last dime to everybody, or loaning your car out, or having 50 people come live in your house. I'm not saying that. That is not what this scripture says. This scripture says bear one another's burdens. So when people are emotionally stressed, when they are physically stressed, when they are spiritually stressed, if that's the term, it is our job to come in and say, listen, I'm praying for you. I'm here for you. I'm a resource for you. You know? Bear and fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? To love one another, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. What can I do to help? Like I said, when somebody dies, I'm, like, I'm very careful to say, if there's anything I can do, well, yeah, there's a lot you can do. Don't say that to people. You say to them, mother, I would love to help you run the house. Can I help you clean up? Can I help you do this? Can I take out the trash? Can I cut the grass? Can I wash the dishes? Can I get you something to eat? That is how you help people. Because when you say, if there's anything I can do, you know at that moment they can't think of anything that you can do, and they're grieving, they're burdened, and they're just not going to make a list. So you make yourself available. Hmm? Bear one another's burdens, fulfill his law. What did he do? He lifted us. What we could not do or would not do, he did for us, and we've got to learn to do that, being led of the Spirit. Verse 3, 4, for man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. You all of that in some chips? Listen, I never believe my own press. I don't care how good I preach this revival, this service. I don't care how well I sing. I don't believe my press. I don't want to be, I don't want to think I'm something and I'm not. And it simply, it simply says, be small in your own eyes. See Jesus, don't see me. It is my job. I should see Jesus and not me. When I look in the mirror, it's Jesus. I give him the praise. I give him the glory. You know, one thing David said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And it be old uh, to inquire and to behold the beauty of his temple, something like that. But you know what my, my desire is? I said, God, I want to praise you so much more. I want to praise you. I mean, I want to praise you. I want the clapping of my hands, the singing of my songs. Lord, let me dance. Just, I need somebody to play the organ for me and the drums. Let me dance and you be glorified. That's what I want. Oh my gosh, I, if I could just praise God out of my innermost being the depth of my soul. I just want to praise him. I want to praise him. I want to praise him. I want to be an awesome praiser. That's what I want to be. An awesome worshiper. That's what I want to be more than anything else. So I don't believe I'm, you know, okay, I've developed a skill. I have some knowledge. I have some experience. I understand that. I understand that. But that is not the purpose for me doing it. Hmm? So don't just say I'm important because I'm important. No, don't do that. It's just because you're nothing. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. What does it mean to prove your own work? You say you love Jesus? Prove it by the, um, by the tests that come your way and how you deal with it. You love it? Do you find your hands doing for people without thinking about it, without them asking? I remember one time, um, Mother Lucas, as Reverend Chanel would say, God bless the dead. <laughs> I don't know why. But Mother Lucas, the Lord just said to me, You got to go see more of her. I think I saw her in church or something. So I'm going to come visit. So the Lord said, You got to go see more of her. So I, I would go and check on Mother Lucas. Mother Lucas, you want something to eat? She said, I don't eat much. And I'm See, all this food in the freezer that people keep bringing her because she can't eat it that bad. And um, so I remember I'm going to start crying again. Y'all know I'm just a bag of work. I remember one day I was coming home from school. I was uh, first year of college, I think, second year of college. Coming home from school, I said, go by Mother Luca's house. I was way over there. I said, okay. And I get there, and she's in the parking lot with her walker trying to take her trash can, I mean, yeah, trash can to the dumpster. 
And she would move the walker and then move the trash can, move the walker. I said, mother, what are you doing? She said, I'm taking my trash to the dumpster. I said, no, ma'am, that is not what you're doing. I got this. She said, oh, well, I didn't have no I said, oh, no, mother. And that thing hit me so hard. That the God of the universe, <laughs> who knows <laughs> the number of each hair on my head, he knows them by name. He, he, he knows this one, he knows that one, he knows this. He knows the hair on my head. That God who created everything, he said, go take out her trash. He cares about her trash. If he cares about her trash, then I mean, Come on. And so we were talking. She said um, she needed some gardening done. She was living in an apartment, but, you know, around her little area. She was responsible for cleaning out the weeds and stuff like that. And I said to myself, I don't work in my own yard. I know I'm not going to go work over here. So I just left it at that. The Lord shook me one morning. He said, now you got to go by Mother Lucas' house today. I said, but I got class. And the Lord said, take some clothes to change. You have to scan. Duh. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I was there and I have no clue what I was doing. You know, she said, just pull it. I like, okay. And um, so while I was there, we were in revival in church. And Rem Chanel came by with the evangelists. They came to pray for Mother Lucas. And they saw me. And they said, oh, man, this is good work. And I, didn't, I wasn't doing it for that, but they saw me doing it. And then um, another time I stopped by there. And she said, oh, I'm glad you came. Because I had to clean out that storeroom. Else I was going to get a $50 fine every day. And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, I'm out there taking the stuff out the little shed and rearranging and all that kind of stuff. But what I'm saying is this. The Lord cared so much about her that he said, I need you to go over there and bear that burden for her. I need you to lift that for her. And this is proving your work. Are you a servant of Christ? Are you a servant of God? Because he can use you anywhere. I wasn't in the pulpit. Nobody saw me. Reverend Chenault and, and um, oh gosh, I, I see his face. I can't call his name. It'll come to me. Um, but um, they saw me. I don't think they said much more about it, but they saw me. But I wasn't doing it for people to see me. I was doing it because I'm a servant. And Father, wherever you tell me to go, I'll go. That's proving my work. Now, you, you can say that that um, that I help the elderly, that I look out for the saints, and I do that now. That's a work that's proven. I don't tell nobody what I'm doing. I'm not telling anybody I'm going to do it. I just do it because that's where he leads me. All right? So that every man prove his own work, then shall he have rejoicing in himself, alone and not in another. Let me tell you something. Nothing. <clears throat> Try not to cry. Nothing makes me feel better than to know that Mother Lucas needed me and I was there. I was there. And when she passed away, her nephew, um, when I saw him, I said, hey, I heard about your aunt. And um, because he wasn't a member of our church, he said, he said, yeah, thank you. And he said, my aunt told me all that you did for her. And I'm very grateful. And I'm like, oh, man. I was just trying to help Mother Lucas out because she couldn't do it. Hmm? And, and I must ask us, what are we doing for the church? What are we doing for the widows and the, the, um, the mothers of the church? What are we doing? So get to work. All right, verse five, we want to rejoice in ourselves and not another, for every man should bear his own burden. Now, we're supposed to bear one another's burdens, and now every man's got to bear his own burden. What does that mean? Well, our job, <laughs> this is our job night, what we do is we are there to offer the support that as the Lord leads us, excuse me, as the Lord leads us to encourage one another, but in the end, you got to bear your own burden. It's yours. Nobody can do it. I, I can't take it. 
I'm supposed to come alongside and help. Okay. But it doesn't mean you have nothing to do. There is a portion that you got to complete yourself. Nobody can do that for you. Nobody can. All right. So you've got some work to do. And your burden may be somebody else's burden. That may be the burden that you have to bear, but we've got to do the work. All right. Verse six, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. All right. But let him who gets teaching in the word give a part in all good things to his teacher. Return that love, return it, even if it's giving or whatever. And, it's, and he talks about monetary gifts in this teaching. It could be the pastor, could be the Sunday school teacher, could be the evangelist. Because verse 7 says, be not deceived, God is not mine. For whatsoever man sow it, that shall you also reap. Whatever seed a man puts in, that will he get back as grain. So when you have experienced someone who has uh, poured into your life, pour into theirs. Pour into theirs. Bake them a cake. Certainly pray for them. Put a little piece of money in their hand. Do something. Sow back into their lives because they have given you their very essence by being obedient to the spirit of God. And, and I'm not saying, I, I sh I'm not trying to make, I'm not gonna make a blanket statement here, but there, I know there have been difficulties when people, when it comes to giving, and people don't want to, uh, I don't know, they talk about crowdfunding. We've been crowdfunding funding for a long time. <coughs> Excuse me. And people don't want to see my gift given to someone else and it seems they have something i don't have okay case in point some people don't want to give at church because they don't want the pastor to get their money and buy a catalog <clears throat> which is certainly not the case of great mentors and probably not in a lot of places either you just think that and i know some people have abused the privilege but i'm talking about the people that are really genuine so we just got to be careful and understand and getting accountability. Where's my money going? I want to know that. Uh, but he says, so the seed you put in is going to return to you as grain. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so God sees what you contribute and he. <laughs> <coughs> And so he gives that to you in return. <coughs> My form. Now, verse 8 says, For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So in our dealing with each other, what are our motives? Where, where are we putting our hope, our trust, where are we putting the seed and to what end, okay? So if my sowing into someone's life is just words to puff them up, then what I get in return is gonna be corruption because that's fleshly. You say, what do you mean? Uh, I dare not use that analogy, but um, you could be, you know, if you're doing this for recognition, and I've seen this happen, you do a lot of things to people, and then all of a sudden, you know, they turn on you and say, well, I don't know why you think you have some special privileges. And then you're like, wait a minute. You did not do this, and did not do that, and did not say this. And then you find that you've been sowing to the flesh, and now you're going to reap corruption. And that's a whole lot of things. But he that soweth to the spirit shell of the spirit reap life everlasting if i do something for you i do it out of the goodness and the purity of my heart and i do it because i i feel i'm in uh, obedience to the, the love of god and i look for god to give back to me 
in life everlasting. Okay. Sometimes I have prayed. I say, God, you told me to do such and so and such. I need a financial blessing. I'll do that. Yes. But what I'm doing, everything I'm sowing, I'm sowing for eternity. Verse nine, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. So this tells me that the sowing into somebody else's life and the bearing somebody else's burdens and being an encourager, he says, don't get tired of doing it. Because sometimes it seems like, I mean, it's exhausting at times to help some people. And I'm not talking about even with money, it's exhausting to encourage them because the more you tell them God he is, and they say, yeah, but, and I said, Lord, in 2022, I am too old to have these arguments. If they don't believe you the first time, I'm not coming back around. So if they just don't want to be happy. I'm going to let them be miserable. He wanted me. <coughs> he wanted me to. He says, don't be weary. Because the more we allow him to do good through us, the more we're going to reap. Okay? The more we praise him, the more we learn to worship him, the more we're going to receive a reward because the enemy wants to snuff out our praise and he wants to kill our testimony. <coughs> do excuse me. <coughs> As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto men, hmm? or unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I need not say any more. It is our job, people, to be that encourager, to be that light on the hill. And, you know, if we can have a food pantry, if we can have a clothing pantry, if we can do public assistance, you know, like utilities and stuff like that, all that stuff is great. I would love for us to be able to do that on a large scale. We can't. So we give $10, $20, you know, maybe. I don't think we ever done a hundred, but like a hundred dollars through the path of Century Scouting, because the little bit that we give allows them to put it in the pot and feed more people and to house people. It may be just twenty-five dollars a quarter, but that twenty-five dollars goes a long way because of the other um, leverage that they have. So we do our part to do good unto the to all men. Now, especially those that are household of faith. So we got to see our people, those who have labored amongst us and prayed for us and, and uh, walked with us and thought with us and encouraged us. We got to make sure we take care of them in their, in their uh, if they have what we call the last days. I mean, if they're sick or old, we got to take care of them. All right? And that just simply means going by cleaning the house, going by fixing them something to eat, taking them out for a walk into the fresh air. Okay. It's not always about money, but do good to the household of faith. If you've got resources that can help others, he says, do it. Okay? I'm just about through. See how large that I've written to you with my own hand. All right, now, verse 11, let me explain that to you. Um, now, it is uh, his historical fact, as much as we know, that Paul had bad eyesight. He did not do a lot of writing. When you read his epistles, it will say that uh, it was written by somebody else or somebody else's hand, blah, blah, blah. So Paul is saying, now, you know, this, this is me writing. And this is a lot of writing for a person with my disability. This is what we believe. All right. But at any rate, Paul says, I'm writing this myself. Okay. Verse 12, as many as desire to show a make a fair show seem important in the flesh. He says, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution of the cross of Christ. Now we've shifted a little bit here. Now he's back to the people who are trying to um, take Christianity and wrap it in Judaism. Saying it's okay to have Jesus, but you got to follow the law too. Because now you got to be circumcised. You can be saved, but you got to be circumcised. To be saved. And Paul says, no. He says, because if they preach Christ and preach the, the efficacy of the blood of the cross, he says, they'll be persecuted. Man, I thought you was one of us. Man, I thought you was a, you know, a, a 
or you ain't, uh uh-uh, we're going to put you out of the synagogue or whatever. And Paul says, they want to seem important. They want you to think that they just know everything. So they talk fast, they use big words, and they just, their head is spinning by the time. He says, they tell you you got to be circumcised, you got to follow the law. He says, no way, no way. Verse 13, for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. In other words, um, yeah, yeah, I go to ABC church, but this my prayer group. This is my Sunday school. This is my, my, my. And so we follow the pastor, but they got to check in, you, we check in with you first. Paul said, no, no. They don't follow what they tell you to do, but they've got you on a leash to do what they want you to do. And oftentimes those people are uh, instrumental in dividing ministries, dividing worship, dividing fellowships. They are. And um, hey, sometimes it goes good, sometimes it doesn't. Most times it doesn't. Verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I also unto the world. Now, this is this this is the testimony. This is the testimony. I don't don't I appreciate the words of encouragement, the accolades, I appreciate it. But the only glory I want to do is not when I show up in the room and everybody say, oh, things are going to change. Oh, we know he preaching tonight. Oh, mm -mm. that's not what I want. What I want to glory in is in the cross that Jesus Christ died on for me. And I'm learning this to look at that cross and see my sin, knowing that my sin has been attached to that cross, dealt with, judged, and it is gone forever. That way the enemy can't hold it over my head. Remember you thought such and -and so-and-so? Remember you did so and so and so? You went back. You said you weren't going back and you went back. No devil. I may stumble, but all of that's attached to the cross. Even in my sickness, I see my sickness is attached to the cross. I'm healed by the wounds in the side. I'm healed by his stripes. And so I'm learning to see them there and leave them there and not take them back. So I glory only in the cross because it is the reason that I am. It's the reason for my season. Hmm? Verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. I said this Sunday, we're not sinners saved by grace. Show that to me in the scripture. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No, 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 no. I'm a new creation, a new creature. Oh, yeah, you, you remember what my outside did. You remember my vocation before I got saved. You remember my addiction before I got saved. You remember all the bad stuff about me before I got saved. But when I got saved, the real me activated. I became a new creature. This flesh still ain't no good. So I'm going to walk in the spirit so I can learn how to keep the flesh under control so that my reputation does not outshine my creation. Now, I just said something right there. You ought to write that down. Hmm? Somebody put that in the chat so I won't forget it. So my reputation won't outshine my creation. Somebody better remind me of that. I'm about to preach that. Don't want my reputation to outshine my creation. I know what I did. I know who I was. I know the things that I'm guilty of. I know all of that. But in him, I'm a new creation. Hmm? Somebody write it down for me. I said, you need to remind me. Text it to me. All right. Verse 16, as many as walk according to this rule, what? Glory in the cross. Peace be on them. You're not going to worry about the machinations of this world. Peace and mercy and upon the Israel of God. Paul is getting ready to get out of here now. 
He says, from henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. You remember from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the death of Christ. So my whole purpose, my whole sacrifice is that this flesh is crucified. It is dead. Paul says in uh, Philippians that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I want to know what it's like to die and become that new creation, that new creature, because I have surrendered my life so that what you see now is not the old me, but the death of Christ or the death of this flesh in me, okay? It says the marks of the Lord, so I'm marked by him, by my faithfulness, by my struggles, by my tests, I'm marked. And you have to even say, it's gotta be Jesus, because I remember when. Hmm? In the last verse, verse 18, brethren, the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. I got through it in one second. Did I leave out some stuff? Probably like pages. But we get the gist of it. Listen, I just want to be like him. You want to be like him. That's why you're listening. And so we've got work to do to keep this old man under, under subjection and let the light of the life of Christ shine through us. Keep praying, keep fasting, keep reading his word, keep meditating on his word, and I promise you his light will shine through. Keep me in your prayers. We'll see you on Sunday. Yes, Sunday is the fifth Sunday. We will see you on Sunday. Um, do pray for Sister Samantha tonight in Gardesia. Pray for them. I don't have an updated report. I will get one. Um, I know that Yardiza was not feeling well, so let's pray for her. Please, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, do so tonight, would you? Go to YouTube, put in Greater Dimensions Done on them, like and subscribe. If you would, I need those subscribers. Um, also, please don't forget to share this with your friends, your families, your loved ones. Share to your page. You can even go to um, YouTube and share a particular video to someone, text it to them, or email it to them. In all that we do, we want to be like Jesus. Well, thank you again, and I will see you on Sunday.